Anyone who adores dragons and vintage science fiction knows, or should know, the legendary Anne McCaffrey. She passed away the same year I graduated high school, but her work set me on the trajectory that became my whole life. Today we will read aloud the story that started it all. For me at least. Hello, Earthlings and Spacelings. Welcome to the Fantasy Podcast, the home of vintage and retro science fiction and fantasy you've probably never heard of. I'm your host, Erica Brickley. You can find me on Instagram at Erica Brickley, spelled E R I K A, B as in boy, R I C K L E Y. Normally, this podcast cycles through full length novels on a set rotation through obscure titles, classics, weird ones, and children's books. However, sometimes I make a special episode just for YouTube that strays from the schedule. Today, we are looking at a short story. I discovered this short story while I was in middle school, maybe 11 or 12 and in 7th or 8th grade. Keep in mind, I grew up in Iowa in the center of the United States when it comes to grade school. Back then, some of the classes were given different names than what we would call them in high school and college. The main ones were history, which was called social studies, and English, also known as language arts. I think this was because middle school classes were more broad than high school ones. Later, we could choose between specific topics like U.S. government, World War II, economics. In our junior high level language arts class, we focused a lot on reading and writing. Any English learner who has met an American will probably know that we know very little about sentence structure, and I think that's because most of the time language arts was about reading comprehension and encouragement rather than technical understanding. We know the rules to our language through exposure, not instruction. <laughs> I couldn't tell you what a predicate is to save my life. Our teachers would have us track our free reading that we did on our own, as well as assign certain books, give us a choice of books, or follow a lesson plan from the textbook. We would also write short papers about the reading we did or do creative writing projects. One of the textbooks that I vaguely remember was The Language of Literature. These were square books, about an inch thick, that were a little tattered from repeated use and full of short stories followed by questions asking what the text was about. I believe Iowa is a state where teachers are allowed to rework their lessons as they see fit, so long as students hit certain milestones, so we didn't always use the textbook nor have, uh, have to answer all the questions. The teacher might instead opt for a class discussion about the reading, possibly having everyone take turns reading paragraphs aloud. I don't remember most of the stories we read in those textbooks. A lot of them were basic fiction stories about kids meeting new people or getting a new animal friend. Even the accompanying artwork was usually pretty forgettable. However, now and then there was a special story that I found myself rereading on my own. One example is Lose Now, Pay Later by Carol Farley. It first caught my attention because the one or two pictures included with it were interesting. Specifically, one of some ice cream or popsicles illustrated with bright colors and cow print. Recently, I found myself thinking about that short story again, so I did a lot of googling and eventually found it. If anyone out there can tell me which volume of which textbook that particular image and story are in, I'd love to know so I can get my hands on a vintage copy. Farley's futuristic story is about teenagers Deb and Trinja in the year 2041, who get hooked on new dessert treats called Swooties, sweets plus goodies, that resemble frozen yogurt dispensed from machines, except they're completely free and the store has no employees. The flavor combinations taste so good, they induce memories for each flavor. Like a sunny beach when you taste the coconut, and your grandma's cookies when you taste the almond. Soon everyone is lining up for the swooties at the multiplying stores, and they're getting fat. <laughs> Suddenly, a machine called the Slimmer is set up in the parking lot, and the strange, slender attendant assures the teenagers that for 25 yen, about 25 cents, they can lose a pound of fat instantly by stepping inside. For every 10 pounds of fat lost, they get a little blue pinprick on their wrist. While the girls are pleased with the shops and machines that are now all over the planet, Deb's little brother Trevor isn't. He thinks there are alien spaceships posted around Earth, hypnotizing human leaders so no one does anything to stop their plan. The Swooties fatten up the population, the Slimmers harvest the fat to be sent into space to be used as fuel. And once someone has too many pinprick marks, it means they'll need to be, quote, 
cold from the flock because their fat content won't be as good anymore, unquote. Deb thinks he's annoying, that humans wouldn't give up their freedom just to eat all they want and stay thin. Besides, she and Trinja like the blue pinpricks, which are starting to look like tattooed bracelets. I can't remember what the comprehension questions asked about this story, but I enjoyed the creepy sudden appearance of two types of machines. I'd totally forgotten about the brother's alien theory. For years, I pondered the greater meaning behind the sweets machines and the weight loss machines mysteriously giving everyone their greatest indulgences. However, much as I loved Lose Now, Pay Later, the piece of text that stands out the most to me from those language arts textbooks is a short story called The Smallest Dragon Boy. Before I get into it, I want to give a little background on myself as a reader. I was always obsessed with books mainly fantasy and sci-fi, and my parents knew that I was smart enough to memorize picture books when I was little, but at some point I stopped being adventurous with it. My reading level really stalled. While my friends were reading Harry Potter and Artemis Fowl, I was still looking at books in the library with elementary school reading level stickers. It wasn't on purpose, and it wasn't for lack of trying. I was added to reading circles or tutoring sessions to get me caught up. There just wasn't a drive to do anything about it. I liked books for kids. For example, I loved The Music of Dolphins by Karen Hess for its emotional subject matter, but it's written from the perspective of a teenager learning to speak for the first time, so the vocabulary and structure is very simple. By the time I reached middle school, I was more or less on the right track, though again, not very adventurous. My mom bought books like A Series of Unfortunate Events to read aloud to us, but I wasn't doing much on my own. Nevertheless, in sixth grade, I was invited to join the Elevated Learning Program, or ELP. The teacher in charge of this class of mature, advanced students was Kathy, my neighbor from across the street. She was an incredibly sweet woman who baked M&M chocolate cheesecakes and treated everyone like her grandchild. After knowing me my whole life, she wondered why no one had nominated me for ELP, so I think she did it herself when I was in fifth grade. It was a simple test for entry, though I only remember one activity. Kathy held up flashcards of objects, and I named them. The only one I couldn't name was an old-school time card stamper, though I recognized it, and thus I was added to the class the following year. Our daily schedule was the same, save for the fact that we had ELP instead of study hall every other day, so I still went to language arts like everyone else. I think a big part of why I was accepted into ELP was that my grades were very good without really having to try very hard. My slight emotional problems from elementary school had simmered down, and I did what the teachers asked me to do as best as I could. High school would prove to be more difficult, but that was years away. In middle school, I didn't have to think about grades. That being said, I still liked language arts best out of all the core classes. Reading and writing were always my best skills. That didn't change the fact that I disliked the textbook readings. I did them because I had to, and they were more fun than math or social studies. One day, I was just going to class like I always did, probably having reread Aquamarine by Alice Hoffman rather than try anything new, when suddenly I heard the name of our homework, The Smallest Dragon Boy. After school, I did my homework and became entranced with this short story. It was everything I ever wanted in a book. There were dragons obviously, and a society of dragon riders around them. I must have read that story three times, wishing it would keep going. For a couple days I stewed, wondering over and over if the smallest dragon boy was part of a longer book. How could I find it? I know every millennial content creator brings up how they didn't have certain technology back in the day, but the 2000s really were a different time to be alive. Yes, I had a computer with internet and Google, along with other search engines, but I wasn't very good at using it yet. The search algorithms were still improving, so you had to sift through a lot more results to try and find what you wanted. Nowadays, I'd say I'm actually quite talented at coming up with keywords to find things, but at age 11, I didn't know what to do. This is where ELP comes back into play, because I took my problem to Kathy the next time we had class. I must have been too shy to ask my language arts teacher about it for some reason. I showed Kathy the textbook with the story in it and told her how much I wanted to find this book, but outside of Smallest Dragon Boy, I didn't have anything to search for in the library catalog computer. Kathy then made the astute observation that I should flip to the end of the story to see who the author was. 
In textbooks like this one, the author's name was at the end, like they were signing a letter. I could look up the author and see what she had written, if this was just a short story or part of a longer novel. Brilliant! Here's where I look back and cannot believe my luck. You see, I grew up in the same town as Grinnell College, which is very wealthy. It gives a lot of money to the local school district. So my middle school had some very nice amenities like a theater study hall, an athletic equipment add-on, and quality playground equipment. We also had a big library. It was smack dab in the center of the middle school, a building as flat and wide as a pancake. There were skylights above and the walls were painted yellow. The librarian's desk was the nucleus, surrounded by islands of desks as well as the computer lab, and the walls were lined with bookshelves. Taking Kathy's advice, I looked up the author, Anne McCaffrey, and went searching. The reason I think I was really lucky was that there were at least two books by McCaffrey on the shelf, Dragon Flight and Dragon Quest. I know now that these are not books typically read by preteens, having been written more for adult science fiction and fantasy lovers like the other greats of the 20th century. To this day, I have no idea how my middle school had such a diverse library as to have literature like that. I'm not trying to say that the Dragon Rider of Pern books are overly graphic and uh, violent or sexual nature, but there were adult topics discussed that were new for me. It's one thing to grow up with movies that talk about those things, since they mostly fly over your head, but having it on the page of a book made it intimate. I like to think that this was the moment when the rest of my life began. Suddenly, my reading level preference jumped from elementary school to college. Yes, I still enjoyed Harry Potter with my family, but I completely skipped a lot of the young adult series that were popular at the time. This was just one of three major book discoveries I made that shaped who I was to become. The other two being Inuyasha, my very first graphic novel that got me interested in Japanese culture, and Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, which showed me a world of authors a lot like McCaffrey. Still, I think the smallest Dragon Boy was the most important to me. I no longer read books below my reading level unless it was for nostalgia. I still haven't read Artemis Fowl. From that point onwards, no one ever worried about my reading skills again, and some adults actually wondered if I'd swung too far in the other direction. The short story, The Smallest Dragon Boy, is featured in McCaffrey's collection called Get Off the Unicorn, published in 1977. My copy has an awesome cover by Paul Alexander that shows a fierce dragon bursting from its egg. I'll admit I haven't read any of the other stories yet because short stories aren't really my thing, unless I'm in the right mood. <laughs> Rereading Dragon Boy, I can't help but wonder if we had a revised version in my middle school textbook since there are so many details in it that refer back to the greater Dragon Riders of Pern series. In this case, the story lives nestled within the original Dragon Flight and Dragon Quest narrative. The main characters from those books even make a passing appearance in this story. For this reason, I will start by reading you part of the introduction to Dragonflight to help induct you into McCaffrey's world. I am of course reading from copies with cover paintings by the incredible Michael Whalen. When is a legend legend? Why is a myth a myth? How old and disused must a fact be for it to be relegated to the category fairy tale? And why do certain facts remain incontrovertible while others lose their validity to assume a shabby, unstable character? Ruckbat, in the Sagittarian sector, was a golden G-type star. It had five planets, and one stray it had attracted and held in recent millennia. Its third planet was enveloped by air man could breathe, boast of water he could drink, and possessed a gravity that permitted man to walk confidently erect. Men discovered it and promptly colonized it. They did that to every habitable planet, and then, whether callously or through collapse of empire, the colonists never discovered and eventually forgot to ask, left the colonies to fend for themselves. When men first settled on Ruckbat's third world and named it Pern, they had taken little notice of the stranger planet, swinging around its adopted primary in a wildly erratic elliptical orbit. Within a few generations, they had forgotten its existence. The desperate path the wanderer pursued brought it close to its stepsister every 200 Terran years at Erahelion. When the aspects were harmonious and the conjunction with its sister planet close enough, as it often was, the indigenous life of the wanderer sought to bridge the space gap to the more temperate and hospitable planet. 
It was during the frantic struggle to combat this menace dropping through Pern's skies like silver threads that Pern's tenuous contact with the mother planet was broken. Recollections of Earth receded further from Pernese history with each successive generation until memory of their origins degenerated past legend or myth into oblivion. To forestall the incursions of the dreadful threads, the Pernese, with the ingenuity of their forgotten Terran forebearers, developed a highly specialized variety of a life form indigenous to their adopted planet. Such humans as had a high empathy rating and some innate telepathic ability were trained to use and preserve this unusual animal whose ability to teleport was of great value in the fierce struggle to keep Pern bare of threads. The winged, tailed, and fiery-breathed dragons, named for the earth legend they resembled, their dragon men, a breed apart, and the menace they battled, created a whole new group of legends and myths. Now, with that as a backdrop, let's read The Smallest Dragon Boy. Although Keevan lengthened his walking stride as far as his legs would stretch, he couldn't quite keep up with the other candidates. He knew he would be teased again. Just as he knew many other things that his foster mother told him he ought not to know, Keevan knew that Batirali, the most senior of the boys, set that spanking pace just to embarrass him the smallest dragon boy. Keevan would arrive, tail fork end of the group, breathless, chest heaving, and maybe get a stern look from the instructing wing second. Dragon riders, even if they were still only hopeful candidates for the glowing eggs which were hardening on the hot sands of the hatching ground cavern, were expected to be punctual and prepared. Sloth was not tolerated by the weir leader of Benden Weir. A good record was especially important now, It was very near hatching time, when the baby dragons would crack their mottled shells and stagger forth to choose their lifetime companions. The very thought of that glorious moment made Keevan's breath catch in his throat. To be chosen, to be a dragon rider, to sit astride the neck of a winged beast with jeweled eyes, to be his friend in telepathic communion with him for life, to be his companion in good times and fighting extremes. To fly effortlessly over the lands of Pern, or, thrillingly, between, to any point anywhere on the world. Flying between was done on Dragonback, or not at all, and it was dangerous. Keevan glanced upward, past the black mouths of the weir caves in which grown dragons and their chosen riders lived, toward the star stones that crowned the ridge of the old volcano that was Benden Weir. On the height, the blue watch dragon, His rider mounted on his neck, stretched the great transparent pinions that carried him on the winds of Pern to fight the evil thread that fell at certain times from the skies. The many-faceted rainbow jewels of his eyes glistened fleetingly in the greeny sun. He folded his great wings to his back, and the watch pair resumed their statue-like pose of alertness. Then the enticing view was obscured as Keevan passed into the hatching ground cavern. The sands underfoot were hot, even through heavy wear-hide boots. How the bootmaker had protested having to sew so small! Keevan was forced to wonder why being small was reprehensible. People were always calling him Babe, and shooing him away as being too small or too young for this or that. Keevan was constantly working twice as hard as any other boy his age to prove himself capable. What if his muscles weren't as big as Batirli's? They were just as hard? And if he couldn't overpower anyone in a wrestling match, he could outdistance everyone in a foot race. Maybe if you run fast enough, Batirli had jeered on the occasion when Keevan had been goaded to boast of his swiftness, you could catch a dragon. That's the only way you'll make a dragon rider. You wait and see, Batirli, you just wait, Keevan had replied. He would have liked to wipe the contemptuous smile from Batirli's face, but the guy didn't fight fair even when a wing second was watching. No one knows what impresses a dragon. They've got to be able to find you first, babe. Yes, being the smallest candidate was not an enviable position. It was therefore imperative that Keevan impress a dragon in his first hatching. That would wipe the smile off every face in the cavern and accord him the respect due any dragon rider, even the smallest one. Besides, 
No one knew exactly what impressed the baby dragons as they struggled from their shells in search of their lifetime partners. I like to believe that dragons see into a man's heart, Keevan's foster mother, Mendy, told him. If they find goodness, honesty, a flexible mind, patience, courage, and you've got that in quantity, dear Keevan, that's what dragons look for. I've seen many a well-grown lad left standing on the sands, hatching day, in favor of someone not so strong or tall or handsome. And if my memory serves me, which it usually did, Mendy knew every word of every harper's tale worth telling, although Keevan did not interrupt her to say so. I don't believe that Falar, our weir leader, was all that tall when Bronze Nementh chose him, and Nementh was the only bronze dragon of that hatching. Dreams of impressing a bronze were beyond Keevan's boldest reflections, although that goal dominated the thoughts of every other hopeful candidate. Green dragons were small and fast and more numerous. There was more prestige to impressing a blue or brown than a green. Being practical, Keevan seldom dreamed as high as a big fighting brown, like Kanth, Fenor's fine fellow, the biggest brown on all Pern. But to fly a bronze? Bronzes were almost as big as the queen, and only they took the air when a queen flew at mating time. A bronze rider could aspire to become weir leader. Well, Keevan would consult himself. Brown riders could aspire to become wing seconds, and that wasn't bad. He'd even settle for a green dragon. They were small, but so was he. No matter. He simply had to impress a dragon his first time in the hatching ground. Then no one in the weir would taunt him anymore for being so small. Shells, Keevan thought now, but the sands were hot. Impression time is imminent, candidates, hmm. the wing second was saying as everyone crowded respectfully close to him. See the extent of the striations on this promising egg. The stretch marks were larger than yesterday. Everyone leaned forward and nodded thoughtfully. That particular egg was the one Batirili had marked as his own, and no other candidate dared, on pain of being beaten by Batirili at his first opportunity, to approach it. The egg was marked by a large, yellowish splotch in the shape of a dragon back-winging to land, talons outstretched to grasp rock. Everyone knew that bronze eggs bore distinctive markings. And naturally, Baturli, who'd been presented at eight impressions already and was the biggest of the candidates, had chosen it. I'd say that the great opening day is almost upon us, the wing second went on, and then his face assumed a grave expression. And as we well know, there are only 40 eggs and 72 candidates. Some of you may be disappointed on the great day. That doesn't necessarily mean you aren't Dragon Rider material just that THE dragon for you hasn't been shelled. You'll have other hatchings, and it's no disgrace to be left behind an impression or two. Or more. Keevan was positive that the wing second's eyes rested on Batirli, who'd been stood off at so many impressions already. Keevan tried to squinch down so the wing second wouldn't notice him. Keevan had been reminded too often that he was eligible to be a candidate by one day only. He, of all the hopefuls, was most likely to be left standing on the great day. One more reason why he simply had to impress at his first hatching. Now move about among the eggs, the wing second said. Touch them. We don't know that it does any good, but it certainly doesn't do any harm. Some of the boys laughed nervously, but everyone immediately began to circulate among the eggs. Batirli stepped up officiously to his egg, daring anyone to come near it. <laughs> Keevan smiled, because he had already touched it. Every inspection day, when the others were leaving the hatching ground and no one could see him crouch to stroke it. Keevan had an egg he concentrated on, too, one drawn slightly to the far side of the others. The shell had a soft, greenish-blue tinge with a faint, creamy swirl design. The consensus was that this egg contained a mere green, so Keevan was rarely bothered by rivals. He was somewhat perturbed then to see Batirli wandering over to him. I don't know why you're allowed in this impression, Keevan. There are enough of us without a babe, Batirli said, shaking his head. I'm of age, Keevan kept his voice level, telling himself not to be bothered by mere words. Yeah, Batirli made a show of standing in his toe tips. You can't even see over an egg. Hatching day, you better get in front or the dragons won't see you at all. Of course, you could get run down that way in the mad scramble. 
Oh, I forgot. You can run fast, can't you? <laughs> You'd better make sure Dragon sees you this time, Batirly, Keevan replied. You're almost overage, aren't you? Batirly flushed and took a step forward, hand half raised. Keevan stood his ground, but if Batirly advanced one more step, he would call the wing second. No one fought on the hatching ground. Surely Batirly knew that much. Fortunately, at that moment, the wing second called the boys together and led them from the hatching ground to start on evening chores. There were glows to be replenished in the main kitchen caverns and sleeping cubicles, the major hallways, and the queen's apartment. Firestone sacks had to be filled against thread attack, and black rock brought to the kitchen hearths. The boys fell to their chores, tantalized by the odors of roasting meat. The population of the weir began to assemble for the evening meal, and the dragon riders came in from the feeding ground on their sweep checks. It was the time of day Keevan liked best. Once the chores were done, but before dinner was served, a fellow could often get close enough to the dragon riders to hear their talk. Tonight, Keevan's father, Kalast, was at the main dragon rider table. It puzzled Keevan how his father, a brown rider and a tall man, could be his father, because he, Keevan, was so small. It obviously puzzled Kalast, too, when he deigned to notice his small son. In a few more turns, you'll be as tall as I am. Or taller! Kalast was pouring Benden wine all around the table. The dragon riders were relaxing, there'd be no thread attack for three more days, and they'd be in the mood to tell tall tales, better than Harper yarns, about impossible maneuvers they'd done a dragon back. When thread attack was closer, their talk would change to a discussion of tactics of evasion, of going between, how long to suspend there until the burning but fragile thread would freeze and crack and fall harmlessly off dragon and man. They would dispute the exact moment to feed Firestone to the dragon so he'd have the best flame ready to sear thread midair and render it harmless to ground and man below. There was such a lot to know and understand about being a dragon rider that sometimes Keevan was overwhelmed. How would he ever be able to remember everything he ought to know at the right moment? He couldn't dare ask such a question. This would only have given additional weight to the notion that he was too young yet to be a dragon rider. Having older candidates makes good sense, Lavelle was saying, as Keevan settled down near the table. Why waste four to five years of a dragon's fighting prime until his rider grows up enough to stand the rigors? Lavelle had impressed a blue of Rameth's first clutch. Most of the candidates thought Lavelle was marvelous because he spoke up in front of the older riders, who awed them. That was well enough in the interval when you didn't need to mount the full weir complement to fight Thread, but not now. Not with more eligible candidates than ever. Let the babes wait. Any boy who is over 12 turns has the right to stand in the hatching ground, Kalost replied, a slight smile on his face. He never argued or got angry. Keevan wished he was more like his father. And oh, how he wished he were a brown rider. Only a dragon, each particular dragon, knows what he wants in a rider. We certainly can't tell. Time and again, the theorists, Kalost's smile deepened as his eyes swept those at the table, are surprised by dragon choice. They never seem to make mistakes, however. Now, Kalost, just look at the roster this impression. 72 boys and only 40 eggs? Drop off the 12 youngest, and there's still a good field for the hatchlings to choose from. Shells. There are a couple of weirlings unable to see over a weir egg, much less a dragon, and years before they can ride thread. True enough, but the weir is scarcely under fighting strength, and if the youngest impress, they'll be old enough to fight when the oldest of our current dragons go between from senility. Half the weir-bred lads have already been through several impressions, one of the bronze riders said then. I'd say drop some of them off this time. Give the untried a chance. There's nothing wrong in presenting a clutch with as wide a choice as possible, said the weir leader, who had joined the table with Lessa, the weir woman. Has there ever been a case, she said, smiling in her odd way at the riders, where a hatchling didn't choose? Her suggestion was almost heretical and drew astonishing gasps from everyone, including the boys. Falar laughed. You say the most outrageous things, Lessa. Well, has there ever been a case where a dragon didn't choose? 
can't say as I recall one, Colost replied. Then we continue in this tradition, Lessa said firmly, as if that ended the matter. But it didn't. The argument ranged from one table to the other, all through dinner, with some favoring a weeding out of the candidates to the most likely, lopping off those who were very young or had had multiple opportunities to impress. All the candidates were in a swivet, though such a departure from tradition would be to the advantage of many. As the evening progressed, more riders were favoring eliminating the youngest and those who'd passed four or more impressions unchosen. Kievan felt he could bear such a dictum only if Betirli were also eliminated, but this seemed less likely than that Kievan would be turfed out, since the weir's need for fighting dragons and riders. By the time the evening meal was over, no decision had been reached, although the weir leader had promised to give the matter due consideration. He might have slept on the problem, but few of the candidates did. Tempers were uncertain in the sleeping caverns next morning as the boys were routed out of their beds to carry water and black rock and cover the glows. Twice, Mendy had to call Kievan to order for clumsiness. "'Whatever is the matter with you, boy?' she demanded in exasperation when he tipped black rock short of the bin and sooted up the hearth. "'They're going to keep me from this impression.' "'What?' Mendy stared at him. "'Who?' "'You heard them talking at dinner last night. "'They're going to turf the babes from the hatching.' "'Mendy regarded him a moment longer "'before touching his arm gently. "'There's a lot of talk around a supper table, Keevan, "'and it cools as soon as the supper. "'I've heard the same nonsense before every hatching, "'but nothing has ever changed.' "'There's always a first time,' Keevan answered, "'copying one of her own phrases. "'That'll be enough of that, Keevan. "'Finish your job.' If the clutch does hatch today, we'll need full rock bins for the feast, and you won't be around to do the filling. All my fosterlings make dragon riders. The first time? Keevan was bold enough to ask as he scooted off with the rock barrow. Perhaps, Keevan thought later, if he hadn't been on that chore just when Baturli was also fetching black rock, things might have turned out differently. But he had dutifully trundled the barrow to the outdoor bunker for another load just as Baturli arrived on a similar errand. "'Heard the news, babe?' Bitterly asked. He was grinning from ear to ear, and he put an unnecessary emphasis on the final insulting word. "'The eggs are cracking?' <gasps> Keevan all but dropped the loaded shovel. Several anxieties flicked through his mind then. He was black with rock dust. Would he have time to wash before donning the white tunic of candidacy? And if the eggs were hatching, why hadn't the candidates been recalled by the wing second? "'Nah, guess again.' Petirli was much too pleased with himself. With a sinking heart, Keevan knew what the news must be, and he could only stare with intense desolation at the older boy. Come on, guess, babe. I've no time for guessing games, Keevan managed to say with indifference. He began to shovel black rock into the barrow as fast as he could. I said, guess. Petirli grabbed the shovel. And I said, I have no time for guessing games. Petirli wrenched the shovel from Keevan's hands. Guess. I'll have that shovel back, Petirli. Keevan straightened up, but he didn't come to Petirli's bulky shoulder. From somewhere, other boys appeared, some with barrows, some mysteriously alerted to the prospect of a confrontation among their numbers. Babes don't give orders to candidates around here, babe. Someone sniggered, and Keevan, incredulous, knew that he must have been dropped from the candidacy. He yanked the shovel from Batirli's loosened grasp. Snarling, the older boy tried to regain possession, but Keevan clung with all his strength to the handle, dragged back and forth as the stronger boy jerked the shovel about. With a sudden, unexpected movement, Batirli rammed the handle into Keevan's chest, knocking him over the barrel handles. Keevan felt a sharp, painful jab behind his left ear, an unbearable pain in his left shin, and then a painless nothingness. Mendy's angry voice roused him, and startled, he tried to throw back the covers, thinking he'd overslept. But he couldn't move, so firmly was he tucked into his bed. And then the constriction of a bandage on his head and the dull sickishness of his left leg brought back recent occurrences. Hatching? he cried. No, lovely, Mendy said in a kind voice. Her hand was cool and gentle on his forehead. Though there's some as won't be at any hatching again. Her voice took on a stern edge. Keevan looked beyond her to see the weir woman, who was frowning with irritation. 
Keevan, will you tell me what occurred at the Black Rock Bunker? asked Lessa in an even voice. He remembered bitterly now, and the quarrel over the shovel and... What had Mendy said about some not being at any hatching? Much as he hated Batirli, he couldn't bring himself to tattle on Batirli and force him out of candidacy. Come, lad. And a note of impatience crept into the weirwoman's voice. I merely want to know what happened from you, too. Mendy said she sent you for some black rock. Batirli, and every weirling in the cavern, seems to have been on the same errand. What happened? Batirli took my shovel. I hadn't finished with it. There's more than one shovel. What did he say to you? He'd heard the news. What news? The weirwoman was suddenly amused. That, that, there'd been changes. Is that what he said? Not exactly. What did he say? Come on, lad. I've heard from everyone else, you know. He said for me to guess the news. And you fell for that old rag? The weirwoman's irritation returned. Consider all the talk last night at supper, Lessa, Mendy said. Of course the boy would think he'd been eliminated. In effect, he is, with a broken skull and leg. Lessa touched his arm in a rare gesture of sympathy. Be that as it may, Keevan, you'll have other impressions. Batirli will not. There are certain rules that must be observed by all candidates, and his conduct proves him unacceptable to the weir. She smiled at Mendy and then left. I'm still a candidate? Keevan asked urgently. Well, you are and you aren't lovely, his foster mother said. Is the numbweed working? she asked, and when he nodded, she said, You just rest. I'll bring you some nice broth. At any other time in his life, Keevan would have relished such cosseting, but now he just lay there worrying. Batirli had been dismissed. Would the others think it was his fault? But everyone was there. Batirli provoked that fight. His worry increased, because although he heard excited comings and goings in the passageway, no one tweaked back the curtain across the sleeping alcove he shared with five other boys. Surely one of them would have come in sometime. No, they were all avoiding him, and something else was wrong, only he didn't know what. Mendy returned with broth and beechberry bread. Why doesn't anyone come to see me, Mendy? I haven't done anything wrong, have I? I didn't ask to have Batirli turfed out. Mendy soothed him, saying everyone was busy with noontime chores and no one was angry with him. They were giving him a chance to rest in quiet. The numbweed made him drowsy, and her words were fair enough. He permitted his fears to dissipate, until he heard a hum. Actually, he felt it first, in the broken shin bone and his sore head. The hum began to grow. Two things registered suddenly in Keevan's groggy mind. The only white candidate's robe still on the pegs in the chamber was his, and the dragons hummed when a clutch was being laid or being hatched. Impression! And he was flat abed. Bitter, bitter disappointment turned the warm broth sour in his belly. Even the small voice telling him that he'd have other opportunities failed to alleviate his crushing depression. This was the impression that mattered. This was his chance to show everyone, from Mendy to Colost to Lavelle and even the weir leader, that he, Keevan, was worthy of being a dragon rider. He twisted in bed, fighting against the tears that threatened to choke him. Dragon men don't cry. Dragon men learn to live with pain. Pain? The leg didn't actually pain him as he rolled about on his bedding. His head felt sort of stiff from the tightness of the bandage. He sat up, an effort in itself since the numbweed made exertion difficult. He touched the splinted leg. The knee was unhampered. He had no feeling in his bone, really. He swung himself carefully to the side of his bed and stood slowly. The room wanted to swim about him. He closed his eyes, which made the dizziness worse, and he had to clutch the wall. Gingerly, he took a step. The broken leg dragged. It hurt in spite of the numbweed. But what was pain to a dragon man? No one had said he couldn't go to the impression. You are and you aren't, were Mendy's exact words. Clinging to the wall, he jerked off his bedshirt. Stretching his arm to the utmost, he jerked his white candidate's tunic from the peg. Jamming first one arm and then the other into the holes, he pulled it over his head. Too bad about the belt. He couldn't wait. He hobbled to the door, hung on to the curtain to steady himself. The weight on his leg was unwieldy. He couldn't get very far without something to lean on. 
down by the bathing pool was one of the long crook-necked poles used to retrieve clothes from the hot washing troughs. But it was down there, and he was on the level above, and there was no one nearby to come to his aid. Everyone would be in the hatching ground right now, eagerly waiting for the first egg to crack. The humming increased in volume and tempo, an urgency to which Keevan responded, knowing that his time was all too limited if he was to join the ranks of the hopeful boys standing around the cracking eggs. But if he hurried down the ramp, he'd fall flat on his face. He could, of course, go flat on his rear end, the way crawling children did. He sat down, sending a jarring stab of pain through his leg and up to the wound on the back of his head. Gritting his teeth and blinking away tears, Keevan scrabbled down the ramp. He had to wait a moment at the bottom to catch his breath. He got to one knee, the injured leg straight out in front of him. Somehow he managed to push himself erect, though the room seemed about to tip over his ears. It wasn't far to the crooked stick, but it seemed an age before he had it in his hand. Then the humming stopped. Keevan cried out and began to hobble frantically across the cavern, out to the bowl of the weir. Never had the distance between living caverns and the hatching ground seemed so great. Never had the weir been so breathlessly silent. It was as if the multitude of people and dragons watching the hatching held every breath in suspense. Not even the wind muttered down the steep sides of the bowl. The only sounds to break the stillness were Kevin's ragged gasps and the thump-thud of his stick on the hard-packed ground. Sometimes he had to hop twice on his good leg to maintain his balance. Twice he fell into the sand and had to pull himself up on the stick, his white tunic no longer spotless. Once he jarred himself so badly he couldn't get up immediately. Then he heard the first exhalation of the crowd, the ooze, the muted cheer, the susurrus of excited whisperers. An egg had cracked, and the dragon had chosen his rider. Desperation increased Keevan's hobble. Would he never reach the arching mouth of the hatching ground? Another cheer and an excited spate of applause spurred Keevan to greater effort. If he didn't get there in moments, there'd be no unpaired hatchling left. Then he was actually staggering into the hatchling ground, the sands hot on his bare feet. No one noticed his entrance or his halting progress and Keevan could see nothing but the backs of the white-robed candidates, seventy of them ringing the area around the eggs. Then one side would surge forward or back, and there'd be a cheer. Another dragon had been impressed. Suddenly, a large gap appeared in the white human wall, and Keevan had his first sight of the eggs. There didn't seem to be any left uncracked, and he could see the lucky boys standing beside wobble-legged dragons. He could hear the unmistakable plaintive crooning of hatchlings and their squawks of protest as they'd fall awkwardly in the sand. Suddenly, he wished that he hadn't left his bed, that he'd stayed away from the hatching ground. Now everyone would see his ignominious failure. So he scrambled as desperately to reach the shadowy walls of the hatching ground as he had struggled to cross the bowl. He mustn't be seen. He didn't notice, therefore, that the shifting group of boys remaining had begun to drift in his direction. The hard pace he had set himself and his cruel disappointment took their double toll on Keevan. He tripped and collapsed, sobbing to the warm sands. He didn't see the consternation in the watching weirfolk above the hatching ground, nor did he hear the excited whispers of speculation. He didn't know that the weir leader and weir woman had dropped to the arena and were making their way toward the knot of boys slowly moving in the direction of the entrance. Never seen anything like it, the weir leader was saying. Only 39 riders chosen, and the bronze trying to leave the hatching ground without making impression. A case in point of what I said last night, the weir woman replied, where a hatchling makes no choice because the right boy isn't there. There's only Batirli and Kalost's young one missing, and there's a full wing of likely boys to choose from. None acceptable, apparently. Where is the creature going? He's not heading for the entrance after all. Oh, what have we there in the shadows? Keevan heard with dismay the sound of voices nearing him. He tried to burrow into the sand. The mere thought of how he would be teased and taunted now was unbearable. Don't worry. Please don't worry. The thought was urgent, but not his own. Someone kicked sand over Keevan and butted roughly against him. Go away, leave me alone, he cried. Why? was the injured-sounding question inserted into his mind. 
There was no voice, no tone, but the question was there, perfectly clear in his head. Incredulous, Keevan lifted his head and stared into the glowing jeweled eyes of a small bronze dragon. His wings were wet, the tips drooping in the sand, and he sagged in the middle on his unsteady legs, although he was making a great effort to keep erect. Keevan dragged himself to his knees, oblivious of the pain in his leg. He wasn't even aware that he was ringed by the boys passed over, while thirty-one pairs of resentful eyes watched him impress the dragon. The weir woman looked on, amused, and surprised at the draconic choice, which could not be forced, could not be questioned, could not be changed. Why? asked the dragon again. Don't you like me? His eyes whirled with anxiety, and his tone was so piteous that Keevan staggered forward and threw his arms around the dragon's neck, stroking his eye ridges, patting the damp, soft hide, opening the fragile-looking wings to dry them, and wordlessly assuring the hatchling over and over again that he was the most perfect, most beautiful, most beloved dragon in the weir, in all the weirs of Pern. "'What's his name, Kivan?' asked Lessa, smiling warmly at the new dragon rider. Kivan stared up at her for a long moment. Lessa would know as soon as he did. Lessa was the only person who could receive from all dragons, not only her own Rameth. Then he gave her a radiant smile, recognizing the traditional shortening of his name that raised him forever to the rank of dragon rider. My name is Heth, the dragon thought mildly, then hiccuped in sudden urgency. I'm hungry. Dragons are born hungry, said Lessa, laughing. Pilar, give the boy a hand. He can barely manage his own legs, much less a dragon's. Kivan remembered his stick and drew himself up. We'll be just fine, thank you. You may be the smallest dragon rider ever, young Kivan, Pilar said, but you're one of the bravest. And Heth agreed. Pride and joy so leaped in both chests that Kivan wondered if his heart would burst right out of his body. He looped an arm around Heth's neck and the pair, the smallest dragon boy and the hatchling who wouldn't choose anybody else, walked out of the hatching ground together forever. The end. And with that, you have been officially invited to explore the wonderful world of Pern created by Anne McCaffrey. I have quite a few books about it, as well as the beautiful Atlas of Pern by Karen Wynne Fonstad with input from the author. I love everything I've read from McCaffrey, including the Brainship novels, the Cholera, and Dinosaur Planet, so check those out. I haven't decided whether or not to cover any of them since McCaffrey is such a mainstream writer for sci-fi nuts like myself. Leave me a comment on YouTube if you'd like to hear more about her work. Don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, bye bye Earthlings!